I had so many people say I wouldn't complete it, that I wouldn't finish, that I would fail. And to be able to go, no, I'm not. I'm going to keep doing this. And nobody was there beside me going, hey, Tony, you got to keep going. I had to get up every morning and achieve something. I had to walk 200 miles a day. You get home and you're just sleeping in bed and you got a shower every night when I didn't have, I, I had 10, I had 10 hot showers in four and a half months. <laughs> so, it, like, the it challenge it, and it's, it's tough and you come back and you're like, what do I do? What's my purpose in this world anymore? Like, I don't fit in. I'm, I'm the weird guy. I'm the odd guy. Like, yeah, I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, but society kept going on. People kept moving on. And I decided to like leave my career and do something weird and different. And so you come back and you feel a little like, okay, well, what do I do next? Who am I? How do I fit in? And with that introduction, I would like to welcome to the show my friend and a mentor, someone I've learned a great deal from in the last few years, Mr. Tony DiLorenzo. Tony, how are you today, my friend? Hey. Great, Matt. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Dude, it was fun Thank because you. earlier we were uh, just randomly, randomly we were on a Zoom uh, a call together. I didn't even know you were going to be there. You didn't know I was going to be there. And I saw you. I said, uh, right. what's making this day great? What I'm excited about is that Tony DiLorenzo is here. And what I didn't say yeah. in that Zoom is what I'm going to share now is how we met our origin story. I think the listeners will like this because it's made a you have made a major uh, change or a major breakthrough in my life has come because I met you and your wife uh, on October 28th, 2019 in San Diego, California at the Front Row Dads Retreat. You and your wife came and spoke. And you had this amazing podcast, One Extraordinary Marriage, and I listened to episode one, season one, and that changed my life forever. So uh, I'll, I'll just, how do you respond uh, to that to kick off, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, episode one, um, 60 Days of Sex. And so Elisa and I have been podcasting since January 2010, and we decided to kick this off. Now, again, this is well before podcasting is what it is today, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, I didn't even know where people were going to listen to this. Tell you the truth, Matt. I, I hired a coach. I was like, somebody told me there's this thing called podcasting and it's like talking and we had been blogging and I really didn't like blogging. It was getting Elisa and I more into fights and we've been married at this point in time, 26 years. Uh, right now, today, 26 years, back then, 13 okay. years. And... Um, Somebody's like, hey, there's this thing called podcasting. It's like a radio show, but it's your own deal. And I'm like, cool. So I hired this coach to help me get on, uh, get it set up and buy all the equipment and everything. But then I'm like, where do people listen to this? Like, we don't have Apple Podcasts like we do now or Amazon or whatever you're listening, Pandora, Spotify. And so Elisa and I, though, sit down behind our microphones and go, what was the big transformation in our marriage? And it was at year 11 we decided to take on our 60 day sex challenge. Mm. Wow. And so, and at that point in time, we were like, holy, holy mackerel, like it changed our lives. And I just want to say that where we were at that point, we had a five and a two year old. We were in a place where either a, we were going to get divorced because we were so disconnected. We were going to wait until our kids turned 18 and then get a divorce or we were going to get radical. And it was in this moment, we were about to lead a small group at our church. We were going to talk about the Song of Solomon. We were going to talk about sexual intimacy. And we just happened to see a segment on a TV show. And they were talking about these two couples who had done sex challenges. And I looked over at Elisa and I'm like, our small group study is going to be eight weeks. And in my head, I'm thinking eight weeks, 60 days, let's do a 60 day sex challenge. And she goes, no, which... Uh -oh. Granted, where we were, totally yes. understand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so the next day, she came to me after I had gone out to work, came back, and she's like, let's do it. And I'm like, let's do what? Like, I was always thinking new things. How do I engage my wife? What am I going to do? And she's like, let's do it. I'm thinking, what? And she goes, let's do the challenge. And that's where my heart sort of stopped because I'm going, what did I just put myself into? Yeah. yeah. And... <laughs> Uh, so there was just this little hiccup of like, okay, thinking, 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 yes, let's do this. And uh, we ended up completing 40 out of 60 days and come to realize it wasn't just about the sex. 
but so much more. And we really grew that passion and love and desire for one yes. another. Uh, even while raising this five and this two year old. Yeah, man. It's, it's like uh, that when, when she said yes, uh, every man out there is like, yes, yes. But then you realize uh, when you are engaged in this, that it's not just physical. It's not just the sex. It's so much more that comes with it. It is the intimacy that comes with it. And I can attest to that. So when yeah. I said that meeting you and your wife has changed my life, it's just that being able to uh, hear that and hear, yeah, this is what every guy dreams of and then realize it's not that that may be like the what gets you into the the, the door is that that sounds exciting but when you do it it's such a transformational experience to do that and i for yeah. those listeners out there heard this uh just, I, I have big testimonial you know for tony and lisa and as we dive into the show today i normally start with a, what's the, what's a big challenge that you've uh dealt with or overcome in your life and i just threw a big pivot because i just got so uh, you know, excited to testify that you have changed my life. So, uh, oh, well, I am truly honored and blessed, man. Um, you know, from listening to the, the show that Elisa and I really, we come behind the microphones with the mission of impacting mm. one marriage. And so for you to share that means mm. so much because really we wake up every day just going, let's impact one marriage. And if we do that every single day, what would, what will happen? And with a lot of times we hear them on the hugs, right. Um, but I don't get them face to face or in an interview like that. So for you to say that really means a ton, Matt, I, I really do appreciate you saying well, that. Well, it's easy to say it cause it's true and it's just been amazing. And then just to, just to see you be able to share this with you is pretty cool. So, uh, now that we've, uh, you know, had the, uh, the Tony DiLorenzo love fest, uh, let's, let's, go. Uh, Let's switch gears and let's uh, let's let's challenge here. So I'd like to ask you, Tony, if you could go back in time and look at something. It can be from childhood or it can be right now. You know, any scope of time in your life. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, what is something that's been an incredible challenge for you that uh, you have endured and you know learned to overcome? Yeah, I'm going to share two because the second one will be quick, but I. I but I want to share that one because that's a personal one to me. The first one, though, is Elisa and I. So I share all that fun mm -hmm. stuff. And yet, four years prior, we lost a child. And so when you lose a child, <laughs> it, it's tough. Um, and so there's a lot of heartbreak. There's a lot of just how do you grieve? And this isn't a time to this is, you know, 18 years ago now. Um, almost 19 years ago, I think now, when we didn't have the dialogue or the conversation around mental health and what do you do and, and how do you get through this and who do you talk to? We didn't have that back then. And so having faced that, it was a tough, tough time. We had a two-year-old, our oldest. Um, we lost Andrew. And then we just went into a dark phase. Uh, Elisa went into a depression didn't really talk about that back then as well. So we're dealing with depression. I'm dealing with anger. We have a massive disconnect in our marriage, in our lives. And, um, you know, to come out of that <laughs> years later, a couple of years later, our daughter was born. And um, it, it's you, the healing process, the grieving. But that was a, a massive challenge that ended up taking me I would say it was probably a good four to five years of processing. Um, luckily for the One Extraordinary Marriage show, that helped me process. And it took Elisa probably about seven odd years to fully process that. But that was really, really a, a challenging moment in our lives. Um, and then to go from that to something a little less um, heavy, I through hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in 2000, and um, what's that? What, what is that? I, for, for I was those married. Who don't know, what, what, is, what is that exactly? The Pacific Crest Trail. Okay. Yeah. So the Pacific Crest Trail is is one of our is one of our historic long trails here in America. So it goes from Mexico, the border of Mexico, California, all the way to Manning Park, British Columbia. So it's 2,658 trail Ooh. miles. Um, wow. And so it's like the Appalachian Trail or the Continental Divide Trail, but it's the one on the West Coast here. So um, at that point in time, Elisa and I were married three years. The trail itself was a challenge. Um, when you're out there for 138 days, four and a half months, averaging 20 miles a day with a 
backpack on your back through all things uh, from extreme heats to extreme cold to river crossings to to just walking through snow for miles on end, mosquitoes, you name it, hitchhiking, whatever you got to do. Um, to overcome that at, at that time of my life was a huge breakthrough. Like things changed in my life. I realized the capacity I had that I never believed I had before that. Um, and so that was really just such a challenge to come from that high of finishing it at that year. I think 300 of us started, I think about half of us or less completed it. Um, and then coming back from that, being disconnected from Elisa and her walking in one, one lunch and, uh, looking at me and saying, I've been looking through the, through the yellow pages. This is back in the day. Yes. 2000, like this is like 2000, 2001. <laughs> the yellow, <laughs> so pages, we're looking at yellow pages. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and she just, she just looked at me and she's like, I didn't sign up for this life. Cause I was just so disconnected mm. and said, I've been looking for a divorce attorney. Um, and so that was a really big wake up call, you know, having just celebrated our four year anniversary going like, Oh my goodness, what's going on. Um, so that was a personal, like, wow, I need to, I need to start to make some changes here and get engaged again. Yeah. What was it? The, you being away for 138 days, was that the disconnecting part was cause I know cell phones in 2000. I mean, I just got my first cell phone in the year 2000. So I guess it was harder to communicate. I mean, what was it? And there's probably a Nextel, wasn't it? Like Nextel was big was in 2000. Yeah, like, the green, like like an Apple. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back in the day. Yeah, it wasn't like the phones we think of today. It was like Nextel, like walkie-talkie stuff. Um, the disconnect was living in Orange okay. County. Okay. So you live in Orange County, California, concrete city. Like everything is moving. Everything is going. Now you're out in the woods, like literally for days at a time before you come into a small town. And when I say a small town, Matt, I mean, you walk into like a town that has maybe like some sort of like grocery store for the folks that live in the area and a post office. And that's all you walk okay. into. And then you're walking on like that was it. And then there's just disconnect, right? Elisa and I weren't together for those four and a half months. So she's having experiences in Orange County. I'm having these transformational experiences of my own life on the trail. And so when you come back, I personally was just a, a, a bit of depression, a, a bit of fear and anxiety of what do I do in this world now? Because I don't understand it. Like I understand waking up every morning, going for a hike, talking to guys that I met who became my best friends on the trail and living life, living adventure, doing something that most people would never do. And most people never thought I would even complete. I had so many people say I wouldn't complete it, that I wouldn't finish, that I would fail. And to be able to go, no, I'm not. I'm going to keep doing this. And nobody was there beside me going, hey, Tony, you got to keep going. I had to get up every morning and achieve something. I had to walk 200 miles a day. You get home and you're just sleeping in bed and you got to shower every night when I didn't have, I, I had 10 I had 10 hot showers in four and a half months. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so it, like it challenge it, and it's, it's tough and you come back and you're like, what do I do? What's my purpose in this world anymore? Like I don't fit in. I'm, I'm the weird guy. I'm the odd guy. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I hiked the Pacific crest trail, but society kept going on. People kept moving on. And I decided to like leave my career and do something weird and different. And so you come back and you feel a little like, okay, well, what do I do next? Who am I? How do yeah. I fit in? I, I think a lot of people might might actually feel that way, even if they are in a day to day. They have a job or they have something they're doing. Like, or really, uh, I don't feel that I fit sure. in. I do feel kind of weird or different. To who am I? I hear this frequently, so I'm curious. In the midst of okay. this, in the midst of uh, you know the, the the challenge you shared about losing Andrew and then feeling disconnected. I mean, how did you make this this transformation to now? Uh, you're these amazing relationship coaches, and you're impacting marriages worldwide. I mean, there's there's a great divide there. Uh, take us back to the moment mm -hmm. that yeah. things started to really shift for the two of you, if you can. Yeah, so I think that the real shift in our marriage, personally, not 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 one extraordinary mm -hmm. marriage, but us, was that sixty day sex okay. challenge mm -hmm. that. 
Because for the first time in our marriage, in 11 years of marriage, at that point in time, we were intentional and we were taking action Mm. in our lives, in our marriage. Like we grew up in a place in time where it's like, get married and everything's just going to roll. And I didn't grow up with self-development or or personal growth. I, I didn't grow up in that world. And so I was just sort of like, okay, we got married. Like, let's go do like life is just going to happen. Um, but it was at that point in time, it was like the first time in our marriage that I can recall other than when we had to get out of debt where we are like, we're going to be intentional every day and we're going to take action. And one of us has to do it because for us to say that we did, we completed a day meant we were having sexual mm-hmm. intercourse. Yeah. So that was that point. Mm. I, it connects with me because I think about, you know, having, you know, three kids that are eight, six and four myself right now. And I feel that my wife and I's relationship is strong and I'm starting to feel like, you know, where is it that, you know, we can become intentional and take more intentional action together. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm sure there are listeners that are connecting with this idea of yeah, intentional and taking action and man, this is tough because I'm managing a job and and my spouse has a job and then there's kids that have their own needs and everything. So yeah, Yeah. how did you even, after the the sex challenge happened, how did you keep that intention and and keep moving forward, Tony? So there's two, there's two. So for the sexual intimacy, Mm -hmm. which is our closeness and connection around our romance initiating foreplay and sexual intercourse. That's what we call sexual intimacy in our best-selling book, The Six Pillars of Intimacy. We broaden that for us and for others. We started what we call the intimacy lifestyle. So layman's terms, we schedule okay. sex. We put it on our calendar. We know when we're having sex. We Not to the day, not to the minute, but in a week's time frame, we know that we're going to have sex twice a week. And it is my responsibility to initiate either on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. Wednesday is our off day or bonus day. And then Elisa initiates on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. So that's how we set that up in our lives. And that has helped our sexual intimacy through many a storms. Like we now have a 20 year old and a 17 year old. There are many a storms we have faced from, you know, just financial loss to my boy being playing his um, semifinal game uh, for football. My boy's big. He's 6'2". At the time, 6'2", 250. He's lost a little weight, but big boy. Semifinal game, he's he's nose tackle. Um, right before halftime, blows out oh. his ACL. Shatters all of our dreams. Oh, man. And... So how do you stay connected, right? Because so much can start coming in and it does. And for Elisa and I, having that intimacy lifestyle set up, it allowed us even through the process to engage with one another and not just be like, well, oldest has ACL. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're doing this. We got this. So we just sort of forget about our, our sexual intimacy for months mm-hmm. on end. Um, the correlation though is we have a very strong emotional intimacy and that's our closeness and connection through our verbal and nonverbal communication. Okay. Okay. Um, and that again is we cover that in the six pillars of intimacy as well. That has grown over the years because we decided on January, 2020, 2010 to have a 30 minute conversation once a week. And that, has become the one extraordinary marriage show. Hmm. Hmm. That's all it, that's what our emotional intimacy is. We, we didn't know it at the time, Matt, I will tell you that we felt like we were, we just wanted to share. We wanted to be open, honest and transparent and talk about marriage more than what you read in books, because there's a lot of nuances, but I look back now and I go, those 30 minute conversations that we have had for 13 years, that has transformed how I engage Elisa, how she engages me, how I speak to her, how I hear her, how we how we do this dance called marriage. Um, and I tell people all the time, man, if you want to if you want to have an extraordinary marriage, 
set aside 30 minutes where you talk to your spouse once a week. And there are literally times, Matt, where things are going on. We're living our intimacy lifestyle. So that's happening. And then we're having a 30 minute conversation. And those are the only sort of two things that are happening. We're doing life because we got all this stuff going on. But those two things happened every week. Mm. Wow. And that talk about, man, talk about being able to stay connected, being able to stay intentional and take action at scale mm-hmm. over time. I mean, not only are there are emotional mm-hmm. and relational lessons here, there, there's business lessons here, there's life lessons. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can apply this uh, specifically to the relationship, though. Um, I wonder how that first book, The uh, Six Pillars of Intimacy, I wonder how did that uh, change things or help to evolve things in the way that you uh, connect with each other and then serve others. Yeah. So that actually was our sixth oh, book. So that was our six. sixth book. Yeah. yeah. That was our Excellent. sixth Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so we've written eight total. <laughs> that was number <laughs> six. Um, you know, after years, and that one came out in November 21. So we had already been doing 11 years of just studying ourselves, studying couples, hearing from the one family. And we would just hear these things that people would say, Elisa does coaching with, uh, you know, has coached well over 500 couples over the years. And there were just things that we kept hearing them say. And for us, it was, what's the framework we live our marriage by? What are those pillars that, have helped us and strengthened us and brought beauty to our marriage over the years. And we looked at those six and we said, ah, okay, this is what we're doing. So this is our framework. We understand when there are cracks in these pillars and how do we get intentional in that specific pillar, take action, you know, different things have to happen in different ways. That's why we have skills. We have a toolbox. We have a marriage toolbox that we go, let's pick up this tool and put it towards that pillar, or let's pick up this tool and put it towards that pillar. Um, and that can happen at different times. And so it, it it came about just because of our own lives, listening to the one family and the many, many coaching clients Elisa has mm. had. Uh, can you share a story of an experience and don't need to share names, of course, but share a story of an experience with someone that you've coached uh, that really hits home, makes it worthwhile, uh, something meaningful to you and Elisa? Hmm. So a couple married 38 years, older, older couple. So they're at that point in time, I want to say they're in their late fifties, maybe early sixties, 38 years married from the South. So think of your older Southern man okay. and just what he grew up with or what he heard from his dad, right? Okay. And just that sort of, uh, I'm the man in the house. This is the way we do things. I'm not going to show my feelings. I'm not going to show my emotions. I'm not going to give you anything, but we're going to live this marriage out. And he came to realize that his marriage was in a bad spot. And he would even tell you that those 38 years of marriage were not the best years. And this was about four years ago now. And he and his wife both began to listen to the One Extraordinary Marriage Show, jumped into our books, coaching. And now I see this man and I actually, I have his number. He texts me and I text him and to see what he's doing. Like we challenge people. We have this thing called, let me show it to you. Oh, it's called the emotion wheel. Oh, cool. You're showing a really cool it's wheel so here on, on, the, on YouTube. You're watching this. This is super cool what you showed us. Yeah. You're going to have oh, to watch yeah. the video. But but it's called an emotion wheel. And you guys can get this. You can pick this up on um, Amazon. Yeah. And so in the middle, you'll find six emotions. Fear, anger, disgust, sad, happy, surprise. And what he began to do when he would feel an emotion, he would look at the wheel. He get the He got the wheel. And he would look at it and he goes, I'm angry. Okay, what am I really feeling right now? Oh, I'm frustrated right now. Because that's the next layer you start jumping into, Matt. So you're going to look over here. You're going to see anger. 
right? Going to get frustrated. Mm -hmm. So that's the next level. And then after frustrated, we're going to go, oh, I'm inferior, infuriated, or I'm okay. irritated. Mm. And so he began to go down and go, oh, I'm really irritated. And then he'd go to his dictionary. He'd open the dictionary and he goes, what does irritated mean? And he learned what the word irritated mm. mean. And his vocabulary expanded. And because his vocabulary expanded, his emotional intimacy pillar was strengthened. So then he was able to tell his wife when he was in this place what he was really feeling in the emotion. So she could then go, oh, I get it. You're not just angry. You're irritated because it's heck of a lot hot out there. And everything you've been working on isn't going the way you wanted it to. Mm. And so... I look at somebody like that and I use them not because they're like completely extraordinary in every which way. Even Elise and I will tell you, we still have our days, our moments, our time periods where we are not extraordinary, but we're heck of a, and the heck going to continue to move forward together and make it extraordinary. But I look at somebody like that, 38 years, who's willing to make a change, who was intentional and was willing to take action and to see the transformation and to see the love and hear from his wife, because we also hear from her. I'm just like, if they can do it, then don't tell me you can't and you've been married five years or six years or 10 years. You can do it. It's just, are you willing to do what it takes? And for some, it means we can pick up just a, a, an emotion wheel and learn something like that. For others, we need to get some help. We need, we may need to go to therapy. We may need to go to a counselor. We may need to get some marriage coaching. We may need to do something else, but don't tell me you mm -hmm. can't because I just see that and I go, he was willing to do it. And he could have sure in the heck lived out the last days of his life and his marriage just being miserable. And he chose not to. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I, I resonate with this story so deeply because it feels like he was willing to, to try. He hit some breaking point or something where he, he was either going to, as you said, uh, divorce or, you know, just keep living miserably or uh, get radical to, to use your words for earlier. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. At what point, if someone is going through life in a marriage and they they hear this episode and they, and they think, yeah, I think that we're OK. And there's not a real hell. Yeah, we're great. And it's not I'm ready to get divorced. They're just, yeah, it's OK. Uh, it's OK. And just by saying it out loud, it makes me feel like mm -hmm. oh, they definitely need to listen to the podcast. But if someone is, is listening and it's it's OK, we're in that season in life, kids and work. What might be a piece of advice uh, that might inspire them to take some action if it's if it's just okay right now. Yeah, I think picking up the book, The Six Pillars mm -hmm. of Intimacy, um, because that gives you a framework to see your marriage, right? I think a lot of times we don't know what our marriages can be or we can go after. Like we, we do it in business. Mm -hmm. We do it at our jobs. Like we'll set goals and we'll be like, we got this. And, but in our marriage, I think a lot of times, and I've seen this even in myself and many others, it's just like, well, we love each other. So it should just work. And yet we have those feelings of just like, it's not what I want it to be. And so I think a lot of times is if you're just in that place where it's plateaued and you're like, it could be a lot better. I think it's resourcing yourself to say, okay, what can I learn that I don't know? And that's where the six pillars comes in because it's a framework. You can start looking at it and going, oh, okay, I see, I see what's going on here. And then I can pick up some tools and we can apply it here. Um, if that's the starting point mm -hmm. and for others, it's like, I need more. Like, so get help. Marriage coaching isn't like forever thing. It's a, it's like getting an oil change in your car. You wouldn't drive your car for 20 years without getting mm -hmm. an oil change. It just, the lights are going to come on. They're going to tell you there's warnings. There's something happening. And in our marriage, we think we're supposed to like, just do it ourselves and just, we'll be okay you know, or we're the only ones going through this. So nobody will ever understand. Um, no, there, you're not the only one. 
I'm pretty sure there are other couples who have dealt with what you've dealt with from infidelity to porn use to broken trust to financial infidelity to, you know, lying, stealing, like, got it. Like, Elisa and I have gone through a lot in our 26 years of marriage. I, I get it. And when we take on this badge, like, it's only us, we're the only ones, then... I think you lose out on the possibility and the potential of what your marriage could I think be. You're so right. That's, you know, and what I do in, in coaching people to scale their business so many times, it's, but no one else understands what I'm going through. It's just me. I, that's why I have a hard time letting go because it's just me. No one gets me exactly. And that's just a, that's a smoke. Mm-hmm. That's a smoke screen right there. You know, and you're not the only person in the world mm-hmm. that is, is going through or gone through this. So getting help, I mean, breaking down that barrier and asking for help, you know, that's, that's it. How do we get yeah. to do that? Cause it can be to me, you and I grew up and I don't have no idea how old you are. You look young. I mean, you look incredibly young. Uh, can I ask you how old you are? My mom said, never ask a woman how old she is. Uh, is it okay if I ask you how old are you? Tony? <laughs> yeah. I turned 50 earlier this month. Get, oh, man. Okay. So, Tony, you can tell he's an eternal <laughs> optimist and he has a lot of sex because he looks incredibly young. Um, so, <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I, will have to, I will receive that because I, I do believe both of those are, are part of why I, I think look so. the way I do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and still physically yeah. fit. And so, you know, these, these, yep. these things are happening. So, uh, I holy! I just totally forgot where I was going with that time. I got excited about talking about sex and youthful exuberance. Uh, so, so pardon me for taking us off. This happens sometimes. Okay, keep going. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so, keep going. It happens well, on my so podcast as well. I, and, and I'm curious uh, when it comes back to the sex challenge. What's the record? Is there a record that anyone has shared with you for how long they've done it? <laughs> so we heard from many of folks. Now, consecutively, I think the the longest I can recall is like four months. So like 160 odd days, I think consecutively. Mm. Um, and don't quote me on exact numbers. I know there was a couple um, who their goal was not to necessarily see how many consecutive days, but how many days in the course of 365 days, one year they could okay. have be sexually intimate and they were like 280 out of 365 days which i find like radical like elise and i did 60 days we did we completed 40 out of 60 days and that about broke me matt like i was done and when when 60 days came i was i was tapped out i was like boom 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 we're good like i'm good um and typically for us since doing the intimacy lifestyle we're having sex eight to 10 times a month. Cause our, our intimacy lifestyle is mm-hmm, twice a mm-hmm. week. So you're figuring eight to 10, maybe if it's a, a good month and maybe you're at 11 or 12. Um, we have done numerous like seven day sex challenges, um, 30 day sex challenges. That's us. But I mean, it just mm-hmm. ranges. I mean, and how people do them now and, and what they're doing is all, all over the place. But I think those are the two big ones that I can recall roughly about 160 days straight. And then the 280 over the course of how did you build up the, the courage to be this vulnerable and transparent, to be able to share intimacy, to be able to share this kind of things uh, publicly like this. And how did that come to fruition? Mm -hmm. So younger. And so you got to think back. So 13 Mm -hmm. years, we started the, the podcast, you know, 13 and a half. And it, you, so you're now 15 years ago, plus when we, we did our first mm-hmm. challenge. And back then, most of the books that I was reading around marriage, because I was interested in marriage. I mean, Elisa and I would lead small group studies for married couples. We enjoyed that. We loved, we loved talking to them. We loved learning about what they're going through and, and fostering that community. So well before we were doing this, we, we would do these small groups and we, and we enjoyed them. But all the books that I kept reading were mainly from men who were in their 60s. And the, the overarching, you know, here's what you're going to do is basically date your spouse okay. and talk to her. That, that, that's what I felt like it was, mm-hmm. right? 
Um, and so when we started the podcast, I told Elise, I go, I don't want to do something that's just going to be frivolous and surface. If we're going to do this, we're going to be open, honest, mm-hmm. and transparent. We're going to have to get real with people because I don't want them to feel like they're alone. And, and I don't want this to be something where we can't talk about something because we're scared to like, we're going to have to engage one another in a way like we've never have. And, and so it's been a process, but it always started from like, let's be open, honest and transparent. And let's talk about these tough topics because I felt like nobody was talking to me about it. And I struggled for so many years in my marriage. And I was like, somebody just tell me when, great, go on a date. Great. Well, I don't have money to, to pay for, for my, babysitter or, and that impacts my sexual intimacy because I'm stressed out and this and that's going on. Like, talk to me about Mm -hmm. that stuff. Not just go take my wife out on a date. Like, yeah, (laughs) that doesn't help me. And so that has always been our passion behind doing it. And I think over years, um, he just sort of go, it's okay. Like, it's always weird when like my father-in-law listens, um, And I don't know if he listens anymore, but early on, he would always comment on when, like, I'm talking and Elise and I are talking about, like, oral sex. I'm like, Dad, really? Like, you got to talk about and comment when I'm, like, talking about oral sex (laughs) on your daughter. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) Oh, that sounds uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So that that one was – those ones were always, like, weird, but – you just sort of go, they know who we are. They know our passion and, and, again, our mission, Impact One Marriage. So if I can be open – and help somebody to open up to their spouse and share what's going on around any of their intimacies, then, then it's worth it. Then I don't need to be scared about what I'm saying or how I'm saying. I, I I love that you brought up the the father-in-law because I playfully thought in my mind, can I ask about that? Cause that sounds uh, like vulnerable and challenging. Cause I, well, on the other side of that, as someone, I'm a part of the Front Row Dads. Uh, that's how we met. You spoke at our group. Yeah. Uh, I'm very curious about how I can show up be the best dad I can be. I wonder for your children, uh, as parents who are growing up, who are, are very uh, you know, sharing and, and vulnerable and transparent and who lead other couples. I mean, are you? what do your kids say? And then how do you frame things with them as they are growing up and hearing this? And how does that, how is that playing out? I'm curious. As a as a parent, I think we got to engage our children because if we do not talk about, and I'm going to just say sex because that's the topic I think most of us parents are most concerned about trying to talk to our children mm-hmm. about. If we're not talking about sex to our children, they're learning it from somewhere else. And if you don't think so, you're you, you have your head in the sand. They're learning. I was introduced to pornography at 12 years old. Mm. And this is back in the day when we only had magazines. So I can only imagine what our kids are exposed to now. So something that Elisa has always said, you only teach your children around sexual intimacy at where they are. You're not telling your five-year-old about like full-on oral sex and everything like that. It's more curiosity asking because they'll say stuff. They'll hear stuff on the playground or in the classroom and they'll say something like, Oh, I know what sex is. And you as a parent are like, well, what, what are you talking about? And you get freaked out. Like, but ask them, well, what, what did you, what does that mean to you? What did you hear? And they will tell you. Um, and then that's when you frame what they're hearing. And so like, for us, our daughter said that she heard about what sex was, and she said it's when a a, a man and a woman kiss in bed. Mm. Okay. Okay. We just framed that a little differently. We just said, yeah, it, it's when a man and a woman who are married mm-hmm. kiss in bed. Got it. So we just framed it for her at that age. Take her now. We talk about it. We're going to be open with her. It's We had a funny and fun conversation with her just even last night. Um, She sat on her bed and Elisa and I were just talking about certain things and even our own lives and prior to meeting one another and what that looks like. And just giving her context and understanding of like, yes, this is what we did. It wasn't healthy. It, It caused 
hurt. It caused pain. And we're, we're here to help you along. You are still going to make your decisions as well as our older will. You guys are going to make your decisions. We're here for you. They all know and they laugh and they'll say stuff like, you always tell us your podcast is your legacy. And I'm like, it is our legacy. It may not be for you. It may be for my grandchildren. Um, but when you get married, it'll be there for you and your spouse to listen to. And you don't have to come to us and we don't have to you know, chirp into your ears. You guys can just pick it up and listen wherever you are in your marriage. You know, We want you to have an extraordinary marriage just as well. Um, but at the same time, in high school, we would um, we would uh, promote, like, have a, a sponsorship ad in, like, the football magazine for the Friday night games. And uh, our oldest, his teachers, a couple of his teachers came up to him and be like, do you know what your parents do? And Alex would look at them and just, huh. um, just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, you got this, you got this kid who's 6'2", 250, star on the football team, and he would just, just like, walk away. He's like, I, I just walk away. I go, did you say anything to him? He's like, no. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> you, you know, but I do believe we got we to gotta be involved in, 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 like you as a front row dad, raising your, your, your children. You know, it, it's coming together with your spouse. It's coming together with your wife and you two having those sort of conversations and who's having them. How are we having them? Um, there are t- conversations I haven't had with the children. Um, and I just let Elisa take that. But then I also come in where I need to come in and, and we do it as a team. We're a team. So not every conversation has to be all of us. We, we take it where we're at and uh, mm. move forward. It's much better than what my dad told me. My dad looked at me when I think I was like 15. He was like, Hey tone. I was like, yeah, what's up dad? He's like, don't get a girl pregnant. And then he walked away. And that was, all, that was my birds and the bees talk. Wow. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, the day that I was dropped off for college, uh, son, there are going to be a lot of different ports at which you could rest your ship. Uh, and my advice to you is uh, don't go to any port. Wait for the right one. Okay. All right. That was it. And uh, there have been thoughts before sprinkled in there about wait till you get married. You know, so that, that was really it. And uh, yeah, so I'm glad that we can laugh about that now and uh, uh, keep moving forward. <laughs> that's, a great, hey man, that's a great one. But it's like, what, what are we talking about? I man? really like, did not know. I now? really did <laughs> not know at the time because there was not. Uh, I had not seen any porn. I think I saw the, the Joy of Sex, that book from the 70s that was on my dad's shelf that I found at 13. Mm-hmm. That was pretty cool. Yes. Uh, but other than that, that was that was really about it. Uh, you know, so, yeah. Right. So I'm glad that uh, we could have this conversation and, and break open uh, probably a topic that for some people, it's, it's private, it's secret, it's I don't know who to talk to. Uh, and just to hear someone share mm-hmm. uh, transparently is, is a real blessing. I, I have a copy of uh, awesome. Six Pillars of Intimacy, the conflict resolution book here. Yes. That's yes. our newest book. Yes. Can you yes. talk about uh, what inspired you to write this newest book and just a little bit about this one, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after the Six Pillars of Intimacy, the secret to an extraordinary mm-hmm. marriage, we found that a lot of couples were getting into it. They loved the framework. And yet in marriage – in most relationships, this can be also be used in a work environment. It could be worked with friendships. It could be worked in, in family dynamics and family relationships. But let's just stick with marriage that a lot of couples say for you and your wife, you pick it up and you're like, well, we have a crack in our financial intimacy. Mm. Well, mm. there are certain things that all of a sudden happen. You may bring it up like our finances are a mess. And I'm not saying this is you guys, but I'm just saying like, for you, you're like, I'm running the business, I'm doing this. And you and, and, and the children are just spending the money and I don't know where it's coming in. And, and we're not, we're not on the same page or we don't have these things set up. And so the conflict arises. And then, so what ends up happening, you guys get upset with one another. And then you just sort of put the book down and go like, well, that didn't work mm. for us. Well, the framework is the framework. It works if you're willing to apply it. So Six Pillars of Intimacy Conflict Resolution came in to help couples go, oh my goodness, we're getting into conflict. There's a conflict cycle. And how do we break that conflict cycle so we can actually begin to be intentional and take action? 
And so that's where that book came out with hundreds and hundreds of clients. Elisa, that's one of the biggest areas she works on when, when she first starts working with them. And so I realized, I was like, Elisa, we got to get this next one out. So that way we can equip couples with another tool in their marriage toolbox that they can pull out and go, we're engaging in conflict. What's going on? How did I learn about conflict? How did I see conflict? And then even understand what, what ways that they, what ways do they um, show themselves? Let's put it that way in conflict. Do you shut down? Do you run? Do you fawn? What, what are you doing in that situation? So you understand mm-hmm. yourself And then looking at your conflict cycle to go, okay, well, how are we going to break this so we don't let this thing escalate and then never get resolution? Can we break it? And there's five steps that Elisa teaches in the conflict cycle where you can break that that conflict, resolve it, and move on instead of having to go all the way through to a boiling point, to you know, escalation, Mm -hmm. to cool down, and all that sort of stuff. So that's where that book came out. And um, we've just heard so many great things from folks who have just been like, I never seen it like this. And it's really just helped us to, to know that we're not the only ones who go through this, but now we actually have a way to break that conflict, that argument, stop it, arrest it, whatever it may be before we just get to this boiling point and blow up. Yes. It, and this is such an important part for our episode and, and listeners, I would encourage you to uh, make a note here because this, this really connected with me on a deep level, Tony, because I find that my wife, she's incredibly highly okay. empathetic. Uh, you know, she's a heart centered more so than I. I'm more cerebral and we have incredible strength together. And one of the challenges is sometimes I'm fixing and she wants me to feel this is a real challenge uh, for me, especially to understand. You know, And I, I look in here and the thing that really connects with me uh, here in the, fir- in the fourth chapter, how we show up in conflict. You have a, a passage in here that says, yes. imagine conflict is more like mining than fighting. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm-hmm. It's more like mining than fighting. How does that How does that play out? Help us understand. Yeah, yeah you're, digging, you're digging for gold. You're learning about one another. So you're trying to find out and learn what, what is happening in this dynamic. And so if we're mining and if we're learning, if we're willing to understand what's happening with our spouse and even ourselves, what can happen? And so you're mining. And so here's a, a, for instance, that I had to learn that I didn't understand. I am the in conflict. Let's get it done. Let's fix it. Let's move on. Elisa, which I didn't realize for many years, is the I hear you but I need to process. And so I didn't understand this. So I saw her shutting down her, her closing off as a disrespect Mm. to our marriage and to what we were trying to achieve or trying to fix, Mm -hmm. let's say fix. But Elisa isn't moving like I am. She has to process. She's thinking through what's this because she's very detail oriented. She's thinking through what happened here, what happened there, what was said there, what did. So she blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I'm just trying to go. So mining for information, learning, Elisa, what's happening? What do you need? How do I help you? And on vice versa, Elisa asking me, hey, Tony, when you get like that, why is it this? Where, where are you here? How can I understand you more? Many a conversations, willing to be intentional, willing to take action, willing to like look at yourself, like know thyself first. You got to know where where this anger is coming from. What's happening here? Like, what did I see? All these sort of things. So we're mining for it. We're we're learning because again, nobody's teaching us this. Nobody taught us how to do conflict. We just saw it and we just repeat it. And if we really want to have extraordinary marriages, and if we want to even have extraordinary mm-hmm. lives, like just in our businesses and with those friendships, we got to understand what's going on because if not, we can blow everything up, which I have. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but you get in these times and you just blow everything up and everybody wants to get the heck away from you. And so when you're mining, you're learning. And now for uh, Elisa and I, when there is that argument, something's happening. I know personally, I'm going to get my piece out. I'm going to listen. And then we know we're going to leave for a certain amount of time 
for her to process, to her to just get her thoughts together, and then we'll give ourselves a time to come back and engage with one another. Amazing. Uh, well, how do we find uh, this book, Tony? Where, where are the places we can get this? Because, I mean, just look at some of the titles of these chapters here. I'm sure this is going to spark some interest. Know Thyself First, you just shared. How We Show Up in Conflict. The Conflict Cycle. Uh, you know, the what, when, where, and why of our conflict cycle. This is really going in deep for those who are willing to commit to doing the work. This is a step-by-step manual of how to understand it, of how to practice it. This is, this is phenomenal. Help us understand, where can we find this book, Tony? How do we get one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Conflictresolutionbook.com and any major online mm. retailer. But that will take you to it, pick it up. Um, it's available in Kindle, audiobook, hardcover, paperback. So you can get it and listen if you're a listener, if you want to just pick one up for you and your spouse and work through it. I will also say for those of you who are in business, you can also use this for your teams. Elisa has taught this to businesses, uh, executives, managers, and just share because nothing's going to, everything we take in there, you can still use in your business environment. Because if you and your team are fighting one Mm -hmm. with one another and and are in massive conflict on where you're moving the company to, you're not going to go where you want to go. If you want sales at $50 million this year, and you guys are complaining about and arguing and in continuous conflict on how you're going to do that, then guess what? You're not Mm going to make it. And it's just like in marriage, like if we want to have, if we want to go after dreams, visions, goals, whatever you want to call them, but we're in constant conflict and contention, we're not going to get there because we're not on the same path. Like we're in two different, like uh, literally we're on two different trails. If I go back to my Pacific mm-hmm. Crest trail um, challenge that I, you know, you're on two different trails. We're not going to get to the same place. That's totally right. So, and uh, I appreciate you sharing it. Conflictresolutionbook.com. Tony, how else might we find out more about yeah. you and Elisa and, and connect with you guys? Yeah. One extraordinary marriage.com. Mm-hmm. That's it. Go there. You'll learn everything that we got. We have some great free marriage resources um, that we have on the site. We have a number of podcasts. I mean, we've been doing it for 13 years, 13 and a half years and counting. We have tons of articles. We're here to help you. We have eight books. We got different things. But if you go there, that's the hub. You can start jumping in where you are in your marriage. We know many of you are in different places. And our goal is to give you the resources depending on which pillar needs the work right now or where you want to just like jump in and go like this pillar is doing great, but I want to learn more Mm -hmm. about how we can, how we can strengthen it even more. So great. Jump on in, learn, um, engage with us. We are, we are very personable. We are very, we are very reachable. Um, we, we want to, we call it the one family because we believe in it. This is a family. This is who we are and this is what we do. So, um, by all means, don't hesitate to reach out. Well, thank you. Well, Tony, this has been a real treat and I certainly appreciate you and love you and just honor you for everything that you have shared with us and you've been so uh, transparent, vulnerable, and real for years. And it's just your testament to when you find things in a challenging place, take action, be intentional. This has been, it sounds like a conversation around marriage and relationship. And what it's really been is a master class around conflict resolution, Mm -hmm. about how to work through things and face the challenge head on uh, as you've done that and demonstrated uh, for years. So, Thank you for that. Uh, We have graduated to the lightning round of questions as we wrap things up here, Tony. Uh, So ding, ding, ding. Let's go, baby. When I say eternal optimism, what does that mean to you, eternal optimism? Oh, man, that there is something always – there's something good, like – Forever and ever and ever. There, there. It's to me. It's a glass is like seven eighths full instead of half mm, empty. Nice. I love it. Uh, aside from your own books and your own podcast, uh, what's a, a a book or a podcast that's been inspirational or impacted you in some way in your life, Tony? Gosh, the longest podcast I've listened to is called Mixergy with Andrew Warner and he talks to a lot of tech entrepreneurs and he talks to different entrepreneurs, but, um, that podcast has been probably part of my listening pleasure for 10 plus years. 
just I just love the conversations that I get Fantastic. to hear there. Thank you. And you're a fit guy. Is there a song or yes. some music that gets you really just fired up and inspired to go tackle life? Uh, EDM when I'm working out, yeah. like lifting. So electronic dance music, like that's, that's lifting. And then when I'm on my bike, uh, I'm a road cyclist. Uh, it is, I listen to a station on Pandora, Toad the Wet Sprocket. So your 90s oh, music, yeah. like your 90s sort of rock. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> so, that's, so, that, so those are my two different ones that I listen to. And it's interesting because I wouldn't let either, I wouldn't let the Toad the Watch Web Sprocket jump into like my lifting. It's just not that kind of to tune I want to listen to. But EDM could go into Good. cycling. Good, excellent. Uh, you know, thank you for putting us on today and sharing everything today, Tony. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, you know, are we honor you and appreciate you, my friend. Thank you very much.